Praise the Lord, everyone out there in podcast, YouTube, and Facebook land. This is Dr. Dennis James Woods. We're here with you one more time with the Revelation and the Revolution podcast. I am so glad to bring this uh, new lesson to you today. Glory to God. Left behind or the greatest Christians that ever lived. You are really going to enjoy this lesson. We're going to be taking a deep dive into the so-called or the plight of the so-called uh, tribulation saints. Is this really some group that missed the rapture cut and got left behind? Or are these the greatest Christians that ever lived? Oh, glory to God. We have to really investigate that because a lot of what we understand, ladies and gentlemen, about the so-called tribulation saints are really talking points from the dispensational camp or the pre-tribulational rapture camp. And so we're going to get into that today. You don't want to miss any of this. And I'm also going to share a clip with you of a good pastor friend of mine who actually quotes from my commentary, even though it hasn't been released yet, <laughs> uh, who's going to uh, uh, quote from my commentary and uh, uh, it's actually the first official exposure my commentary uh, uh, has, has had, even though, again, it's still in production. Uh, I was able to send him some information that uh, helped his sermon. Uh, so I want you to enjoy that as well. From this planet. So I talked to my good friend, Dr. Woods. Stand very quick so people know who you are. Uh, Dr. Woods is actually, he's humble. He don't see how quick he stood up and sat down. I don't care. He is a scholar. He and I talk often. We talk so much. But eschatology is the study of the last things, a lot of which we find in the book of, of, of Revelation. And I want to get his view. Does the Revelation really deal with nuclear war? And he gave an instant. He's very careful. He does. He's not definitive because he couldn't be definitive. But I want to read Revelation 6 and 14. Note what it says. The heavens receded like what? like a cloud, like, I'm sorry, like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. He says in his commentary, he has a book, a commentary on the book of Revelation, and it's not out yet, it's been published, being published, I hope you'll get it when it comes out, I'll have him have a book signed, see, I already committed. But here's on that part, the sky was split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up and every mountain and island were moved from their places. He said, this and its associated passages identify upheaval that is clearly cataclysmic. The passages by John portray a series of ap uh, apocalyptic judgments tied to the day of Lord rather than a single event. Where scholars disagree is whether these events are figurative or literal. An option to be considered is John is viewing literal futuristic events, but describing them from a limited first century perspective. Remember, John is writing in year 100, the first century of the church. He doesn't know anything about this technology. And in another So what he goes on to say here is that now that we are in the 21st century, we must consider the existence of weapons of mass destruction. John's figurative description could be that of nuclear explosion. When you watch that series, you're going to see nuclear explosions that are unbelievable in their power. Let me finish with Dr. Wood's statement. He says, when a nuclear or hydrogen bomb explodes, it releases massive amount of energy. The hotter air in the fireball gets pushed away by the cooler, denser air. This causes the lower atmospheric clouds to roll back in a manner that John describes as the sky was split apart like a scroll. Wow. Wasn't that a great uh, 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 introductory uh, uh, promo into the use of my commentary? Uh, I just really appreciate uh, Pastor Singleton. He's a great guy. And uh, here in the south suburbs of Chicago and Madison, Illinois, and uh, we just thank God for him. It's a mega church. Uh, they, I've taught there on many, many occasions. And uh, so I just thank God uh, for Pastor Singleton and uh, his uh, 
uh, ministry and the church there. They all love me and my wife and my wife and I. And so we just thank God for them. Now, what you're going to see next is three clips concerning uh, the tribulation saints, like I say, the so-called tribulation saints, and uh, we're going to follow that with a uh, with a lesson dealing with and counterpointing this whole narrative about these poor, unfortunate left behinds. So enjoy the clips, and then we're going to go right into my lesson in Jesus' name. We must not forget that this vast crowd of tribulation saints rejected the mandated mark of the beast. They will have refused to worship the Antichrist. And as a result, thank God that they're going to be saved. But we must not forget that they're martyred. We must not forget the cost that they pay. For the Bible tells us in Revelation that they will suffer persecution. They will suffer hunger. They will suffer thirst. Because by refusing to take the mark of the beast, the Bible says without it, no one can buy or sell. These people who have rejected the Antichrist and his mark will have no way to purchase groceries, will have no way to eat. They'll be forced to live like wild animals. And because most of modern society has lost the ability to survive in the wilderness and to survive on their own, they will face starvation, they will face hunger, they will face thirst, they will face scorching heat, they will probably face torture, and eventually the Bible tells us that they're martyred and many, of course, are even beheaded. But the day is coming very soon when the church is raptured, we're at the marriage supper of the Lamb for seven years. And for seven years, the wrath of the Lamb, it's not judgment, it is wrath. The wrath of the Lamb hits in the earth. The good news is people are still getting saved because Revelation 7 shows us a massive number of people that get saved during the tribulation. That's the good news. The bad news is if you're saved, you'll probably be killed by the Antichrist. It's going left to be behind. And so they're in the churches crying and praying, but it's too late. The rapture of the church has already happened. And those who are left behind know that their only chance to spend eternity in heaven is to reject the Antichrist and pay the ultimate price. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we had just viewed three, basically three clips. And all of them paint this very melancholy, uh, terrible, real dark type of thing about the tribulation saints themselves. Now, of course, the time is going to be perilous. I've, absolutely, there's no doubt about that. But the question is, is who are these tribulation saints? Pre-trib is forced to say they have to be people that were left behind and they were left behind because they have to be people that were backslidden. See, that's the, you, you're forced into that narrative or else you have to confess that they're part of the church. So what they did is they came up with the counter narrative to say, well, they're not the church, so they have to be these other people. The problem with that is there's no scriptures in the Bible that actually back that position up. Because every time we see the tribulation saints, the so-called tribulation saints in Revelation, it's in an esteemed position. I mean, there's, there's nothing ever said about them... Uh, uh, weeping because they got left behind or showing them in any type of uh, position where they're distraught or anything like that. According to the Bible, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why they are persecuted is because God is the one who permits it. Glory to God in the name of Jesus. And so um, we need to really, really uh, get that uh, clear. Now, one of the things I wanted to do is I, as I share my screen, I want to uh, share with you, uh, glory to God, one of the charts, one of my uh, charts that you will be able to kind of follow along with me 
uh, here. Now, this 70, this line here, this horizontal line here represents Daniel's 70th week. This is a seven year period. The first half is three and a half years. The second half is three and a half years. So far as the rapture's doctrines are concerned, they're all concerning when in these, in this seven, in regards to the seven year period, does the rapture happen? The pre-trib rapture is say the, the rapture happens out here before the beginning of the seven year period. So they say the rapture happens over here. So under a, and this would be the pre-trib narrative. So because, and this is why pre-trib says what they say. They said, because the rapture happens over here, glory to God, the Antichrist hasn't, uh, or the person who becomes the Antichrist, because they really don't like to even call him that yet, but uh, uh, the person who signs the covenant, okay, because he hasn't been revealed, the temple, they say because it's, that hasn't, been he hasn't been revealed yet. The temple isn't built, any of these things. So the church gets raptured way out here and the church will never see this covenant happening. The church will never see the temple built. The church will never see this individual come on the scene and see any of that. So that's why they say that because they say the rapture happened way over here. So now when it comes to the tribulation saints, this is where the Antichrist, ladies and gentlemen, comes on the scene. Let me see bring the, the second chart in. Okay, now, and, uh, in this scenario, we see this is where the abomination of desolation happens. That happens right in the middle of the seven years. First of all, at the beginning of the seven years, the covenant is inaugurated with many. That's Daniel 9.27. Then in the middle, the abomination of desolation happens. That's when he walks into the temple, declares himself God, 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 2, verses uh, 3 and 4. Okay, that's where he goes in, declares himself God and all of that. Okay, right in the middle. So that means the tribulation saints would be people who are here at this time and after. Or people, according to pre-trib, would, would be people who are left behind at this point over here because remember, pre-trib already raptured way out here somewhere. So now all of these people straight up into the time of the Antichrist, uh, these are the ones that are left behind. And so by the time the beast comes to power, and that's kind of where it kind of gets shaky for the pre-trib position because he's technically not the Antichrist over here yet. Not technically because he only has 42 months. He doesn't have, if he had, now, he, if he had 84 months, yes, indeed, this would be a position that uh, uh, pre-trib definitely uh, could take. Now, if he had three, uh, again, 84 months. So if he had 84 months, all of these seven years would be his time. But the Bible says he only has 42 months. So when the beast ascends from the bottomless pit, possesses the person that's going to, who signed the covenant, this is when he emerges out of Revelation uh, 13, chapter uh, verse 1. And this is why under the sixth seal, if we are to just ex accept that as the arrival of the human, the man that's going to become the Antichrist, that's why under the sixth seal he's seen riding in on a white horse. And that would be right around the beginning, right here. He rides in on a white horse. But by the time we get to Revelation 13, he's not on. He's not riding a white horse anymore. He's 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 actually uh, rising from the sea, a beast with seven heads and ten horns. His his the symbology changes for him, and it's a reason for that because there is a demon that comes out of the bottomless pit that has that that is involved with him taking on this new characterization that we find in the middle uh, of the week uh, uh, and further on. And so, so again, so Preach Rib says the rapture has already happened out here. So everybody that's on this timeline here all the way to the end, these are all people that were left behind. Now, you're going to have an unbelieving world, ladies and gentlemen, that are just secular, don't believe in God and all that. Obviously, they'll be here. 
Uh, by this time, this is when the mark of the beast will happen right here in the middle, okay, because that's, the beast only has 42 months, so he can't issue the mark of the beast in this three and a half years because he hasn't emerged from the bottomless pit yet, and he hasn't started his 42 months. Again, he doesn't have 84 months. 84 months would be the whole seven years. He only has 42. So since he has 42, this is when the, the demon comes out of the bottomless pit, Revelation 11, 7, and Revelation 17, 8. Those are your passages for that. Okay, so when he comes out of the out of the uh, bottomless pit, this is when he will start his tirade against the saints. Okay, now because I am pre wrath, the position that I teach, I don't teach this position that the church is raptured here. I teach that the church is raptured in between the somewhere between the middle and the end. So as a pre wrath rapturist, my my position would be over here between the two. Okay, between the middle and the end. And so my position would say these people that the Bible called, that the pre trib calls the tribulation saints, my position would say, no, those aren't tribulation saints that were left behind. My position would say, no, these are God's people that still the church that have not been raptured yet. That's the position that I'm taking. So, uh, obviously, pre-trib would disagree with that because they would say the rapture has happened over here. The problem is you have all these people during the tribulation period getting saved. So that means you have to, if you're pre-trib, you have to account for millions and millions of people being saved during this period. You have to account for that. How do they account for it? Well, they say there's going to be 144,000 Jewish evangelists that are, that are marked in Revelation chapter number 11, uh, verses, the, the first few verses of that chapter, it talks about the sealing of the 144,000, 12,000 of each one of the tribes of Israel. You know what the problem with that narrative is? There's not one passage of scripture saying these people will preach, that they hold revivals, that they will help people get saved. The, those passages in Revelation do not exist, ladies and gentlemen. That is a completely contrived uh, 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 a doctrinal response to the fact that you have all these Gentiles getting saved. So this is what pre-trib did: is they come and they say, "Well, these people get saved. We know they're not. We, 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 we know they get saved. We're saying they can't be the church because we already got raptured over here. So whoever gets saved after that, that can't be the church. Now they might end up. They may end up in heaven if they pay the ultimate price." But you know they're going to have to live like wild animals and all of that. And so what ends up happening is in their way to explain what the Bible actually presents, <laughs> the way to do it is you have to categorize the uh, uh, the uh, so-called tribulation saints as number one, backslidden Christians who didn't make the rapture cut, people who are going to have to really, really suffer for it. And like one of those videos said, man, the only way they're going to get to heaven is the ultimate price. They got to give their life. It sounds kind of like what Paul did and what Peter did what Jesus did. <laughs> it sounds like what Christians have been doing since the beginning of time, paying the ultimate price for their faith. And guess who's honored in that? God. Now, the other issue, ladies and gentlemen, is this. They make it seem like they're just here and the Antichrist is just having their way with them. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not true. It's not true. So let's let's go back to glory to God. Let's go back to my desktop here. So let me get a new share in here. Glory to God. So now, ladies and gentlemen, let's just go to Revelation chapter 13. And we're just gonna have a we're just gonna have a good time. You know, you know, you know me. I'm I'm lighthearted. I love this stuff. I can do this all day. Glory to God. So let's go to Revelation 13, 5. And we're just we're, we're just gonna we're, we'll just look at the passage. Let's just let's just look at look at what the passage offers us. Okay, now. Glory to God. All right. In verse number five, it says, and the beast was given a mouth. Let's go to with back with the NASB. 
it says, uh, there was given him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. All right, now remember this, he only has how many months? 42, three and a half years. That's all the time the beast gets, okay? He cannot start his time at the beginning of the 70th week. Now, the 70th week starts its time. The 70th week itself starts its time. Its clock starts running the 70th week with the inauguration of a covenant. Glory to God. Because God says 70 weeks uh, are determined upon thy people to bring a point of six point agenda, you know, to end up the seal up prophecy for the end of sin, the reconciliation for iniquity. There's a bunch of things that he mentions there. You have to go back in your own time, read Daniel 9, 24 through, 20, uh, uh, through 27. The 70th week is the week we're waiting on, and all this seven-year period hasn't come. It's, we're getting close, I believe. Glory to God. So, so the bottom line is, is when the uh, uh, this, that seven-year period happens, it's a, it's the, the sign for that seven-year period is the covenant being signed. Each one of those periods had something in relationship to the period. Like for example, the first seven years, the temple was built. The, the, the next 62 months, uh, Messiah was cut off, but not for himself. And the city was thrown down and terrible and, and troublesome times and all of that. Glory to God. And so the 70th week is, uh, is, is shown, the sign of the 70th week is the covenant. Glory to God. So the seven-year clock, yes, it starts with the signing of the covenant, but the time for the beast does not start then because his time doesn't start until the middle of the uh, 70th week, ladies and gentlemen, until, glory to God, uh, uh, and, and until and from the middle of the week to the end, and he only has 42 months. That's why the Bible is very specific about that. He only has 42 months. Now, Listen to what it said. It was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay, now let's, let's deal with this, okay? Now, let's look at this in the, um, this, uh, let's go with the, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible. Or we can go with the Holman Christian Standard Bible. It doesn't make a difference. Holman Christian Standard. Christian Standard Bible is a, is a newer English version. Now listen to this. Ladies and gentlemen. This is what it says. And he was permitted to make wage war against the saints. Ladies and gentlemen, that's interesting. Who do you think permits him to do it, okay? I don't want to give you my own opinion. So here's what we're going to do. Let's go to one of these passages that people think that that's next to Jesus. <laughs> Dr. John MacArthur. So we're going to let MacArthur tell us. We'll, we'll see, because see, you might think I'm being biased. Oh, Dr. Woods, there you go again, and this thing and that thing. Okay, so what we're going to do, we're going to pull up a commentary. And we're, and we're going to actually let, let another scholar get in on the conversation. So we're going to go to John MacArthur, and this is what it says. Antichrist will not be all talk. He will also be capable of decisive, deadly action. Once again, this text uh, denotes that Christ, the Antichrist can only do what he is given permission by Almighty God to do. Now, ladies and gentlemen, this is important. And I wanted to bring this up so that you'll understand, ladies and gentlemen, that or what's really going on here. So listen to this again. It says, once again, the text denotes that Antichrist can only do what he is given permission by God to do. Thus stressing that he never relinquishes his actual control over events. Okay, so in other words, God is the one who is permitting the Antichrist to make war with the saints. Well, I didn't need John MacArthur to back me up on that. I already know what I'm talking about. But the bottom line is I wanted to get another witness for you. So, glory to God. And so as we as we see here, uh, 
again, that uh, Antichrist will make war with the saints. Uh, and um, it says he will successfully make war with the saints and overcome them does not mean that he will have the power to destroy their faith. Okay. He will have power physically, but not spiritually. Genuine faith cannot be over, cannot be destroyed because neither death, I, I actually, I think I like this. It says, Antichrist will successfully make war with the saints and overcome them. But remember, he got his, the permission to do it from God. And it does not mean that he will have power to destroy, it does not mean that he will have power to destroy their faith. He will have power over them physically, not spiritually. Genuine saving faith cannot be destroyed because neither death nor life, nor angels or principalities or things present or things uh, powers, nor heights nor dead or any other thing will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Jesus Christ. Now it's interesting that MacArthur uh, supports, you actually quotes this here because he's applying this concept, ladies and gentlemen, to people who he say is not in the church. And it's interesting that he would apply Pauline theology here to fix po folks that are in Christ. Because according to him, because he's a dispensationalist, he would say that the tribulation saints are not a part of the church. Uh, they get saved during the tribulation, but they're not part of the church. So as we go back, so the thing is, is, the point we wanted to make here was, is that Antichrist is permitted to make war against the saints and to overcome them. He's permitted to do it. Glory to God. And so the bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, so that means, what that means is, ladies and gentlemen, that these saints are not here or being persecuted merely by the whims of the Antichrist. They are being allowed to be sacrificed on behalf of the Lord because of their witnessing power that they have and giving their life over to the Lord and, and paying like that one video said, the ultimate price. Ladies and gentlemen, everybody got to die to get to heaven except for those who do get raptured from the church. Let me give an example of what's going on. Let's go to uh, Revelation. Uh, let's go to chapter number two in Revelation because this is important to understand. Glory to God. Revelation two, listen to what he says to the church of Smyrna, ladies and gentlemen. He says, uh, uh, I am the, uh, to the angel of the church of Smyrna, the first and the last, the one who is dead and comes to life says, now listen what he says. The one who's dead and comes to life. This is the one who's about to say to the Smyrna church what he's about to say. He says, I know your affliction and poverty, yet you are rich. Rich. I know the slander of those who say they are Jews, but they are the synagogue of Satan. Do not be afraid what you are about to suffer. Listen to what he says. Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. In other words, I'm telling you ahead of time. Smyrna church. What's going to happen is what? The devil is about to throw some of you into prison and test you. God already knew it was going to happen. God already set provision for them in this. And maybe like Job, maybe Satan came up there and talked to him about it. I don't know. Maybe they, maybe they had a conversation because, you know, it was God that threw Job out there when he talked to Satan. Satan didn't say, give me Job. No, God was the one who threw Job out there. He said, look, you can have him. Glory to God. Because God gets the glory in this. See, what we're not understanding in our doctrines, ladies and gentlemen, is God gets the glory even through human suffering. It's not that he's some macabre, um, uh, uh, sadomasochistic type of person, type of deity that enjoys watching people suffer. But what it is, the, the fact is, is he is pleased by our faith. See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so people who love not their lives unto the death is an expression of faith that overcomes the world. And this is why Jesus says, I am he who was dead, but behold, I have overcome the world. I've overcome the world. How Jesus overcame the world is by coming here, dying, and then raising again from the dead. So this is why this, this uh, 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 encouragement to the church of Smyrna comes from the one who was dead and then came to life. You see, 
So he says, do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison to test you. And you will have affliction 10 days. Look what he says. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Now, how, how well does that go over in churches today? That don't go over well. Look, I ain't signing up for all that dying stuff. But now, here, Jesus is not talking to some quote-unquote tribulation saying, this is the church. He's telling them, this is what's going to happen to you. He said, but be faithful unto death. I will give you the crown of life. And then listen to what he says. He says, uh, and then to the church of Pergamon, he says, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, and you are holding on to my name and did not deny your faith in me. Listen to this. Listen to this now. This is what he's saying. Even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness who was killed among you. His faithful witness, God didn't, Jesus did not send Michael the archangel down there to set him free, to let him out. It answered his suffered and died just like anybody else. And from what I understand, the historical account, I think he was boiled in oil or something like that. Some, some gross thing, painful thing. But you know where Antipas is now? Do you know the reason why we know about Antipas? Not because Antipas rant and prayed for 40 days and 40 nights to ask the Lord let him go. No, we reading about Antipas because he gave his life. He was a stand-up Christian who stood there and took it and would not take down. That's why we're reading his name right now. That's why we, I don't know who he was. I don't know what he looked like. I don't know who his mom and daddy was. Or nothing. I don't know where he grew up. The only thing I know about Antipas, like the rest of us, is he was a stand-up Christian who wouldn't take down for his faith. And that was one of the things uh, that Christ admired about the church of Pergamum. Okay, so now, ladies and gentlemen, so the, so so this idea, ladies and gentlemen, that the tribulation saints are these people who were left behind, and, and now and now all of a sudden they got to go through all this bad stuff. Listen, it's God is the one who permitted them, and the reason why God is permitting them to go through it is because it's it's the witness power of people who will not take down for their faith. Ladies and gentlemen, in the midst of persecution, ladies and gentlemen, these people are standing in there for Christ Jesus. Oh, glory to glory to God. So let's look at some of the past. We just got to go. I don't, I don't have much time left, but we're going to look at some of the passages about these tribulation saints. And every time you see them, ladies and gentlemen, it's a place of honor. Glory to God. The first time we uh, get an inkling of the tribulation saints is under the uh, at the, the opening of the fifth seal. Let's look at this. Glory to God. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar people slaughtered because of the word of God and the testimony which they held. Now, this is why they were slaughtered. And they weren't they weren't slaughtered because they got caught up in the club or they was they was doing this thing or doing all. These are people who wouldn't change their testimony nor their faith in Jesus Christ. This is why they died. Not be not because they got the electric chair because they murdered somebody or uh, got got falsely accused. None of that. This is why they did it. And you know what? This is something that's thematic through Revelation. They were, he was on because of the word of God and the testimony that they had. Listen, let me show you something real quick. I'm going to digress real quick here. Let's go to uh, chapter 1 in Revelation. Do you know this is why John said that he was being persecuted? He said, I am your brother and partner in tribulation. Paul, John said, listen, I, I, I'm uniting with all the brothers who go through the struggle. And the struggle is, is being a Christian, living here on earth, being the dry branches with Jesus is the green. He said, listen, if they did it to the green branch, then you know what they're going to do to the dry. He said, they haven't, he said, the world, he said, they hate you because they hated me. Glory to God. Listen to what he said. I, your brother and partner in tribulation in the kingdom of endurance that are in Jesus, that are in Jesus was on the uh, island called Patmos because of what? because of God's word and the testimony about Jesus. That's why he was being persecuted. This is the same reason, ladies and gentlemen, the same reason that these people who are called the Mamby Pamby got left behind tribulation saints. This is the same reason that we see them being persecuted, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go back to the fifth seal. He says, I, he opened up the fifth seal. I saw that uh, uh, I saw under the altar the people slaughtered because of the 
God's word and and his the testimony they had. Glory to God. They cried out with a loud voice, Lord, holy one who is holy and true. How long until you avenge our blood of those who live on the earth? So he said, so uh, a white robe was given to each one of them and they were told to rest a little while until the number would be complete of their fellow slaves and their brothers who were going to be killed just as they had been. So in other words, God said, we can't go back for the day of vengeance, the day of my vengeance. John, uh, Jesus talked about that, uh, uh, Luke 4, uh, when he was in the uh, uh, temple reading Isaiah. And he closed the book at the, right at the, at the comma in the middle of that verse. This is the acceptable year of the Lord. The reason why he closed the book is because the next phrase said, and the vengeance of our God. With the vengeance of our God, that happens during the day of the Lord. And at this time in the sixth seal, we still haven't gotten to the day of vengeance yet because that's why these saints are in heaven crying out, when can we go back and get vengeance because they'll be with him when he comes back to get the payback and so that's why they were uh, they they were interested in this and he said but he and god said we can't go back and tell because there's more of y'all that got to get killed well why is god saying let's why is god waiting till more people die see in other words that means god could have stopped it and not waited until a certain number is reached he could have just said oh no they, they down there suffering so i gotta go down there and get them now before any more people die no god is saying we're not going because it's some more that have to die see see ladies and gentlemen we got this thing all wrong we got it all mixed up okay glory to god and so this is this is the first time we see the tribulation saints they are in heaven he said, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the people who had been slaughtered for the word of God and the testimony. They're in heaven under the altar, ladies and gentlemen. This isn't a mamby-pamby group of people that, that, that didn't know Christ and was in the club when the rapture the trumpet blew and they were smoking weed somewhere and got left behind. Come on. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a ridiculous narrative, but they had to come up with something because how else do you explain all these people getting saved? And you claiming the church is gone already. The church isn't gone. That's the whole point, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, now, the next time you see these so-called tribulation saints, these so-called mammy, and, and, and this is, and as you see, the, the 144,000 here, glory to God, all from the tribes of Israel, not one verse anywhere in the entire book of Revelation says anything about them preaching to anybody, holding revivals, ministering to anybody, witnessing to anybody, holding revivals, saving people, and, and, and throw, throwing some type of great thing. That is a completely contrived talking point because they had to come up with something because how else do you explain if the church is gone how these people get saved you got to put it on the 144,000 even though the bible doesn't have one verse that says that's what they do that's pretty true of saying that there are no verses in revelation that say that okay now so now let's look at it. He said, then after this, I saw a vast multitude of every nation, people, tribe, and language. The reason why it says it like that, because they're not Jews, they're Gentiles, right? Which no one could number standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb. Where are they? They are before the throne of God and before the Lamb, okay? Now, we're going to see why they are there. Glory to God. And then one of the elders asked me, who are these people robed in white? And where did they come from? He said, sir, uh, you know. And then he told me, these are the ones who came out of the great tribulation. They have washed their uh, uh, robes white and made them white in the blood of land. And listen to this. Listen to what, how he says this, ladies. Says, For this reason, because they went through this time period and they were faithful. And they remain faithful under the worst conditions in all human history that Jesus said there will not be, never be another time like this since the beginning of time, nor will it ever be repeated. They come out of a special time called the Great Tribulation. And for that reason, and because they held on to their faith, not under optimal situations like we have here in the United States, where we all go to church on Sunday and wear, wear our suits and pull up in our nice cars and got our mega churches and a nice 
PA systems and the screens. And I mean, we're just doing it over here in the United States, right? We're just doing that. Of course, other Christians like that around the world, they're not so, you know, they got people getting killed now. A lot of people being martyred now for the faith. But we don't talk about that over here because our evening news doesn't want to show you that. So we are, we're here in America. We're on the delusion that everything is hunky-dory and everybody has a joyous Christian la 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 kumbaya existence everywhere on the earth. It ain't true. There are people right now, ladies and gentlemen, that are giving their lives, that are dying, having their property destroyed, being locked up. Why? Because they got a Bible. Because they believe in Jesus. This is why the Bible says, for this reason, they are before the throne of God. They serve him day and night in the sanctuary. And the one seated on the throne shall shelter them. They were no longer hungry, no longer thirst. No sun would strike them or any heat. Glory to God. For the lamb who is at the center of the throne would shepherd them. He would guide them and live, bring them to, uh, uh, springs of living water. And it just goes on with the things of the blessings of those people. So that's another. So the first time we see them, their souls are under the altar saying, God, we got to go get, get, get some payback. The Lord saying, get, get, give me a few. We got to wait on your brothers now. We can't, we can't lead them out because the dead rise, the dead in Christ rise first so we got to wait till the full number of dead and when when that happens then we can go and do take care of our business glory to god snatch up the living and all that which we see that picture of, of the rapture in revelation 14 lord god and, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen and then in 15 and 15 1 the tribulation saints that were on earth are now in heaven <laughs> they up there playing harps and stuff ladies and gentlemen this is so good. It's good. But pre-trib to mess the whole thing up because it done told us it can't be like this. And that's why all this confusion about the Bible, all this confusion about Revelation, why people don't read it. Oh, pre-trib said it doesn't, it, does, it doesn't apply to us, so therefore we're not going to be here. La, 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 la. Oh, my goodness. Come on. The next time we see the tribulation saints or, or hear something about them, glory to God. It's in Revelation 12. Come on. Let's look at this. Let's look at this. This is the characterization. We're talking about this. It says salvation and power of the kingdom of our God and, and of us and the authority of Messiah now has come because the accuser of our brother has been thrown down, the one who accuses them before our God day and night. And they conquered him. Listen to this. And they conquered him. Who is that? The devil. Let's get out. Let's go back to the NASB. And they and they and they overcame him because of the blood of the lamb and because of the word of their testimony and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Now, we saw in one of those videos, now I want you to match that with how those people in that video put it. They were going like, well, the, the only way that the, if they get left behind, they're showing all those dark images. And those who are left behind know that their only chance to spend eternity in heaven is to reject the Antichrist and pay the ultimate price. The only way now, the only way for them to get saved now is to be killed by the Antichrist. Like they are so unfortunate. It's like, dude, if you'd have just been a little bit better when the rapture happened, you wouldn't have to go through all of that. But now that you are here, ooh, the only way you can be saved is to get your head cut off. Ooh, you poor you. And you should have just been listening and paying attention and something school a little better and you'd have got caught up in a rapture and you wouldn't have to go through all of this but now you got to get your head cut off shame on you good thing you still can be saved though that's the narrative pre-trib paints ladies and gentlemen ladies and gentlemen this is the greatest group of christians the world has ever known because they come out of the most difficult time the world has ever seen so this is what it says they they love not their lives even when faced with death. Even when faced with death, ladies and gentlemen. They didn't love their life. Glory to God. Does this sound like some group of mammy pammy Christians that were just two weeks ago smoking weed in the club and all of a sudden the rapture happened and they go, oh, okay. Oh, hell yeah. I guess we'll do it now. Got to get my head cut off. Oh. Ladies and gentlemen, come on. This is just, it's ridiculous to do this. The greatest group of Christians that we're looking at. This is why Revelation is uniquely their story. It's uniquely the story. That's why you. That's why in the first resurrection, in Revelation 20, you only see the people that had the mark of the that that had victory over the mark of the beast. 
it's not that that's the only people in the first resurrection. There are other people part of it. But the reason is, is revelation is their story. Why? Well, it's other people's story that's they're living at that time too. But it, but that group is being featured. Why? Because this is the last group of church saints, ladies and gentlemen, who come out of the worst time in history. No humans and earth's history has ever lived through something like these people come out of. So Revelation highlights their work. And that's why you see them. Glory to God. All right now. So the next time they love not their lives to death. So the next time you see these people is right here. And and, and it was said, and it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Okay, so that so these are the same ones who were laying their lives down. This is these are the same ones who was under the altar saying, "Look, we want to go get payback." Glory to God, cause it you know get like I said, they suffered. Now nah, we're not saying they didn't suffer. Glory to God. So they said they want payback, but these are the ones who refused under the worst conditions and the greatest temptation to get the mark of the beast is going to be those Christians that, ladies and gentlemen, who want to stand with Christ. That's the story of Revelation. Okay, so now. Uh, this is the next time we hear. So this is an another thing. So now this, there's a beatitude that comes up. Glory to God. And this is what happens. Uh, well, the beatitude isn't yet, but this is what this is what the encouragement uh, it says. Okay. If anyone has an ear, and listen to this, we don't want to uh, overlook this. All who dwell on the earth will worship Him, the Antichrist, whose name have not been written from the uh, foundation of the world in the book of life of the lamb who has been slain. So what that tells you is, ladies and gentlemen, everybody that gets the mark of the beast, their name is not written in the Lamb's book of, of life. Everybody who doesn't get the mark of the beast, their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Sorry, John MacArthur, you can't get into heaven if you get the mark of the beast. Why? Because that means your name isn't in the book. If your name is not in the book, how do you get into heaven? I don't care what theological arguments you guys come up with. How do you get someone in heaven, someone in heaven whose name is not in the Lamb's Book of Life? Tell me the connection or the connect or the string they pull to get into heaven when their name is not in that book. You tell me about it. Find it in the Bible. You can't find it, of course. Look, all right, now. So this is the next time. Listen to what it says. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. Go to the NIV. I like this. How uh, NIV says it. If anyone, if anyone is to go into captivity, because it's been predestined, you're gonna go. Into captivity, you're gonna go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. So this is what God is saying to his people at this time. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. These are the same people whose souls was under the altar. The same people that God said, wait a minute, there's more people. Got to come. The, the revelation was looking, revelation five at the fifth seal, six at the fifth seal was looking forward to these people joining their number. Glory to God. He said, so if you're going to get killed, you got to be killed. Why? Because God knows the number. And then when, he, when that's filled up, then he's ready to move. Glory to God. But it's more witnessing power that happens. Now, if there's a reason why people get saved during the tribulation, it's not because you make the uh, 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 the, the 144,000 evangelists. What it is, is these people are going to lay their lives down and, and, and their testimony because of the testimony that they held. See, they're going to be giving their testimony. Now, we do have indication that that's what they're going to be doing. They're going to be giving their testimony. And it's through their testimony that I believe there'll be other people that come. He said they was killed by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. It, it, not the testimony they kept to themselves, the testimony that they're going to be singing, Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. While they're going to court, while they're getting their head cut off, they're going to be praising God. They're going to be doing just what Paul and Silas did in jail when they was in the stocks after they had gotten beaten. They were praising God. What ended up happening? The folks in the jail ended up getting saved. 
<laughs> Listen, God knows what he's doing. These aren't mammy-pammy Christians, ladies and gentlemen, that got left behind. That's the whole point I'm making to you. That's not the truth. The truth is, is these are precious people. Glory to God. As it says in the Psalms, precious. And let, let, me, let me turn to that. Glory to God. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. This is what it says. Oh, here's Psalm 116. I want you to look at it, ladies and gentlemen. Look at this with your own eyes. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Listen, it's precious to him, but he's the one who permits Antichrist to get it. So it's not that they were left here at the whims of the Antichrist. No, God had a purpose and permitted him to do it because as they are giving their lives, they are giving their testimony of Jesus Christ and in that testimony deliverance is going to go forth. They're going to stand up and they're going to overcome the devil because of their testimony. Oh, glory to God. You don't believe me. Oh, glory to God. Listen, look, look. You know, I know you don't believe me. I know you don't believe it. See, see, y'all have been listening to this pre-trib stuff so long that it done, it, it, it just gonna be got in you, uh, you know, but we're going to we're gonna say, we're gonna show you something that Jesus said. Oh, I, I just thank God that he he brought it to me. Glory to God. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Luke 21. Oh, let's go to Luke 21. Oh, glory to God. Thank you, Jesus, for bringing that to my memories. You know, because I get excited. I don't remember all this stuff all the time. Glory to God. Listen, listen, listen. He said it. But before all things, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you to the synagogues and prisons and bringing you before kings and governors for my name's sake. Whose sake? His name's sake. It will lead to an opportunity for your testimony. That's the power in Revelation 12, ladies and gentlemen. Revelation 12, 11, that's where the power is. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. As Antichrist is killing these people, they are testifying about God and they're heaping their hot coals on Antichrist's head. But as people see it, glory to God, if they ain't got the mark of the beast already, there'll be other people who come in because because these people are standing up for Jesus. Oh, glory to God. Just like in the book of martyrs, there was a young man by the name of Germanicus. Look it up, ladies and gentlemen. They said he, he took his persecution and his martyrdom with such valor and such faith in Jesus Christ. He said that the pagans that watched them gave their life to Jesus. Now, these are powerful testimonies. This is powerful stuff, ladies and gentlemen. We can't let tradition and all of this stupid stuff that we hear about, oh, Christ wouldn't let us go through that. And if you get into, listen, that's not true, ladies and gentlemen. What's true is, is God is the one who allows them to be persecuted. Oh, glory to God. Y'all done got me fired up in the name of Jesus, because I'm telling you, uh, glory to God, we have to stand and let people know, glory to God, if pre-trib is right and we all go home, fine, but what if it's wrong? This is what you got to deal with. This is what you got to know, and this is why the Bible says what it is saying, ladies and gentlemen, and so we just give God the glory. We give God the praise in the mighty and the matchless name of Jesus. Oh, glory, glory to God, and so uh, our, our next passage, as soon as my computer gets unstuck here, uh, glory to God. And so I just want to thank God, ladies and gentlemen. I get really excited. I get really passionate about this because it's real, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, glory to God. So now we're going to go to the, the next time we see these people in Revelation. It's Revelation 14. Oh, let's go to Revelation 14. Number one, ladies and gentlemen, listen what happens here. The Lord is gracious. He then sends, glory to God. First of all, he sends an angel to preach the gospel to the world. The wrath of God still hasn't fallen yet because God sends an angel to preach to him, okay? All right, now, but listen to this. Then he says, another angel came, a third one followed, said, if anyone worships the beast and receives a mark on his forehead, on his, forehead, on his hand, he also would drink the wine of God's wrath of uh, uh, the wrath of God, which is mixed full strength 
in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with brimstone in the presence of holy angels in the presence of the land. And the smoke of that torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image or receive the mark of his name. Now listen to what he says here. Now don't let anybody fool you about this talk about you can get the mark of the beast and still be saved. <laughs> listen, if you go to hell because of that, that's your fault. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> John MacArthur telling you, oh yeah, you can go there. It's not, oh, it's not the unpardonable sin. Sure, you can be forgiven for that. All right, you listen to them lies. <laughs> you can listen to that if you wanna. You're you gonna be post toasties messing around, <laughs> messing around with John MacArthur. <laughs> you gonna be on fire, <laughs> okay? Not fire, on fire. <laughs> This is what it said. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. Does this sound like a group of people that's left behind it, that, that this is what's going on? This is a group of people that are special because of their faith. God even sends an angel to encourage them, say, look, don't get the mark of the beast. You're going to go to hell if you do. Because it's a unique commandment committed, committed at a unique, uh, uh, given for a unique sin that's connect, committed or uh, uh, that can, occurs during a unique period in hu human history that will never be repeated again. So he sends an angel to give a new commandment. The commandment is given from heaven. God is gracious. He gives people a chance not to get the mark of the beast. He sends an angel to tell them don't do it. That's grace, ladies and gentlemen. Listen to this. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, right, blessed are the dead that die in the Lord from now on. Now, wait a minute. Oh, that's one of the Beatitudes, the seven Beatitudes in Revelation. This is one of them. Okay, now listen to this. Every one of those people that you heard, oh, yeah, but you can get saved, but you know they're going to have to die. They're going to get off the sacrifice. They're going to be li living like wild animals on the street, and, and they'll have to die for it. Ladies and gentlemen, you can either believe that report or believe this report. What does the Bible says that the Lord says about them? Does he call them forsaken? And I heard a voice saying from heaven saying, shame on y'all for being here doing the mark of the beast. Did I didn't hear that. I heard a voice from heaven saying, you are forsaken. You should have been right. You should. I heard a voice from heaven saying, you missed the rapture because you was watching the wrong thing on TV. That's not what this said. He said, and I heard a voice from heaven saying, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord. The Lord calls them blessed, not forsaken, not cast down. Blessed. And guess who backs it up? Yes, says the Holy Spirit. Look at says the Spirit. They will rest from their labels and their deeds do follow. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying. He is backing up the fact that they are blessed because they're died. Not unfortunate, not left behind, not forsaken, none of that. That's not the language of revelation. The language that you've been hearing about the tribulation saints is pre-trib. It's tradition. It's their talking points because they have to explain how people are getting saved when the church is supposed to already be gone. That's why they do that. Okay, now, now look, right after this, he said, we're not going to forget your deeds. And look what happens next. Then I looked and behold a white cloud and sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man having a gold crown on his head. Notice how the, his is capital there, son of man. Where did we see that before in Revelation? We saw it in, uh, or the son of man. But where did we see, where did we see this before? Revelation 1.13. Let's look at it real quick. It'll pull it up here. Glory to God in, in a second. It should be pulling it up. There it is, okay? And among the and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, one like the Son of Man. Glory to God. Uh, 
That's what he's the same. It's the same reference here. A son of man having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his head. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. The, the him is Jesus here. And the angel saying came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him sitting on the cloud. Says, put in your sickle for the hour to time to come is reap and the harvest of the earth is ripe. Guess what? Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, not on it, but over it, and the earth was reaped. Now, this is the last time, ladies and gentlemen, after this, you never see the tribulation saints on earth again. You don't see them on earth again. You know why? Because in the next chapter, Revelation 15, guess where they are now? After the Lord gets his harvest, he says, then I'm going to quit with this. Oh, one more after this. Then I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels who had the seven last clays, because in them the wrath of God is finished. Okay? And I saw something like the sea of glass mixed with fire. Guess who's there? And those who had been victorious over the beast and over his image and the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, holding the harps of God, and they sang the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Almighty Lord God, Almighty righteous are your ways, O King of nations. It says King of saints in the King James Version. Now, wait a minute, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> These people were just, on Revelation 13, they was getting their head cut off. The Bible said, be patient, be patient, hold on. Hey, if you got to die, you're going to die. If you're going to jail, you're going to jail. Just hold on. Then the next time we see the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven, I mean, uh, uh, the a voice says, shouts from heaven, hang on, glory to God. You're blessed if you die in the Lord. You're not cursed. You're not forsaken. You haven't been left behind. You ain't been forgotten. None of those pejorative, none of those, none of those negative terms. He said, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And then he says, your deeds will follow you. Then right after the Holy Spirit says that, Guess what? The Son of Man comes down on a cloud. Now, wait a minute, now, ladies and gentlemen. You, we can't make this up. They talk about the rapture is not a revelation. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? The Son of Man gets his harvest, whoop, swings his sickle over there. Oh, they said that's judgment. It ain't judgment. That's not judgment. That's the Son of Man getting his harvest. There's another group of people who are judged, and it says they're thrown in the wrath of God. I'll go back and show you that. Glory to God. But then the next time you see the tribulation saints, they're not in New York. They're not in Jerusalem. They're not there. Where are they? Here in Revelation 15, they're in heaven. But listen, they're in heaven while the angels that had the seven last plagues are still in heaven. So they're in heaven when the angels who has the bowls are in heaven. Guess what? The angels haven't left yet. And then he said, after these things, I look in the temple of the tabernacle in the heaven was open. The seven angels who had the seven plays came out of the temple, clothed in white linen, bright, and girded around their uh, uh, girded around their chest with golden sashes. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels the seven bowls of the wrath of God, who lives forever. So these angels, the saints are already in heaven. Uh, uh, the tribulation saints, what they call them the tribulation saints, I say it's the last church, the last generation of church saints. Now they're in heaven before the angels that have the bowls of wrath even leave to go pour the bowls of judgment out. And so when by the time they are getting ready to leave, ladies and gentlemen, this is what he said. And I, I'm, I really do have to end with this. He says, then I heard a loud voice in the temple saying to the seven, go pour your bowls out on the, uh, 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 pour your bowls on the, out on the earth, the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the angel went and poured his bowl out and on the earth, and it became a loathsome and malignant sore on the people who had the mark of the beast. Now, doesn't it make sense that when God's ready to pour his wrath out, glory to God, that the first bowl hits the people with the mark of the beast? I mean, it kind of like makes sense, right? The people who were on earth being persecuted by them, glory to God, are off the earth, they're in heaven, they're up there singing. 
while these angels are taking care of their business. Glory to God. Now, I didn't put this in Revelation. I didn't make it up. Okay, but let's go back to Revelation 14. I want to show you something. People say, no, this is this is an angel and it's judgment and all of that. Okay, so let me show you. Let me just show you something here. So now, this is what happens. First of all, the Son of Man gets his. All right? Glory to God. And then, uh, and then after that, then it says, and another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. Now, people say, see there? It say another angel, so that means the other one was an angel. No, it doesn't, ladies and gentlemen. John uses, and I saw another angel many, many times in Revelation because angels are part of apocalyptic literature, and he sees a whole series of them. I saw another angel. He says that a bunch of times in the book of Revelation. Okay? All right, so now, he says, another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He had a sharp sickle. Then another angel, the one who has power over fire. You know, it's interesting. There's angels that have power over fire. Have we been noticing something on the earth? Hasn't there been a whole bunch of, like, serious fires that come up, burn up whole cities and stuff like that, and then just kind of go away and then just hit another, another one up? Well, I'm not saying it's him. You know, I don't know if he's... <laughs> If he's slipping out of heaven, he's just get, get, getting some fun in. But there's an angel that has power of fire. That's one of the judgments, ladies and gentlemen. We've been seeing a lot of fires. They've been in the news. You know about them. Okay, but anyway, that came out from the altar, and he called with a loud voice to the, the angel with the sharp sickle, saying, Put in your sickle and not gather the harvest, but gather the clusters from the earth because the, her grapes are ripe. Now, wait a minute. Jesus had a harvest. Glory to God. Put in your sickle because the harvest of the earth is ripe. But now this one is because the grapes are ripe. Hmm. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth. Now this is different. The son of man swung his sickle over the earth. This one swings it to the earth, and, and what he did, he gathered the clusters of the vine of the earth, and what did he do? And threw them into the winepress of the wrath of God. Ladies and gentlemen, it's two different, it's two different, it's two different gatherings of two different things. The Lord gets his harvest and going about his business. You don't hear no more. Then another angel comes out and gets his harvest, but that harvest is the wrath of God. The, the first harvest wasn't appointed to the wrath of God. That's why they weren't there. That's why they're in heaven before the angels with the bowls even leave. <laughs> Revelation shows you that. Then the next thing, ladies and gentlemen, for real though, the last scripture. I know this is a long lesson, ladies and gentlemen, but I got to do it. I mean, I have to teach you. Pastors don't have time to go through detail like this while they're in the church. They just don't have time to do it. Okay, now, look at this. Verse number four. I saw thrones, and they, they that sat upon them, Revelation 20, and judgment was given to them, and I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. There's that phrase again, the testimony of Jesus Christ and the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast, nor his image, nor received the mark on their forehead or their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now, listen to this. The rest of the dead did not come to life till the thousand years was complete. This is the first resurrection. There's two resurrections. Jesus talked about them. Okay? Blessed and holy is the one that has part in the first resurrection. Obviously, blessed and holy are the people that is part of the, who didn't get the mark of the beast. So that means the first resurrection has people in it that were still here during the time of the Antichrist. They're in the first resurrection. Now, pre-trib, I say, well, the first resurrection, like Dr. Walbord, this is what Dr. Walbord says. Dr. Walbord said, well, first just means anything before the second one. You know, listen, ladies and gentlemen, the reason why only the tribulation saints are mentioned here, because revelation is their story. These are the ones who come out of that time. All Christians don't come out of that time. They're all in heaven. We'll all be in heaven, but we're all not going to be a part of this scene. Look, it's like the relay race. 
Only the anchor man breaks the tape. The starter man and the two people in the middle, they do not break the tape. They go sit down. They do not get that glory. Now, they celebrate as a team. They all get a gold medal. They all they all win. They all get their face on the Wheaties box. But, ladies and gentlemen, only the anchor person breaks the tape. So this group of Christians, ladies and gentlemen, of church saints, this group is highlighted here and connected with the first resurrection. You can't say they're not in it. Glory to God. So in other words, and look at what it says. Blessed and holy is the one that had part in the first resurrection. That's the same thing that the Holy Spirit told the people that were dying of Christ. So now these are the scriptures in Revelation, in my closing, that talk about the so-called tribulation saints. This, these are the scriptures. Now one passage says they're forsaken, feeling bad, ugly, left behind, sinning, got left behind. See, that's why I don't teach a preacher of rapture. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a whole bunch of points wrong with it. And long before we even get to this, you know, if you listen to my material, I start with the restrainer. They talk about the restrainer is going to be removed and the church is the restrainer before the Antichrist can be revealed. All that is wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, they got the wrong restrainer. Number one, they got the wrong one. Uh, but, but anyway, anyway, then they say, well, the Christians are the ones that got Roe versus Wade overturned. No. What actually happened with the Supreme Court, just to, just to get to that, what actually happened is, is the Supreme Court threw it back to the states. <laughs> That's what they did. And so you still have states that do it, states that don't. So it's not, you know, it's kind of like, uh, you know. But anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a Christianity wrapped in an American flag. Please, that is not what this is. The bottom line is, ladies and gentlemen, the people who come out of the great tribulation are being honored in heaven because Jesus said it is a time of trouble that has never been since the beginning of the world, nor will ever be. That's what makes them special. There's never going to be another mark of the beast. There's never going to be another antichrist. There's never going to be the stuff that we see in the book of Revelation, the seals, the bowls, the judgments. I mean, the seals, the trumpets, the bowls. You're not going to see there's only going to be one Armageddon. Even though the Satan will make a run on the holy city, it ain't going to be a battle. God is going to destroy them with fire out of heaven. But, ladies and gentlemen, so let me go. God bless you. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Love all y'all for real, though. In Jesus' name.